Well, hello and welcome to my next story from somewhere. Today, I'm on the White River in Indianapolis, Indiana. So, I thought we'd do a story here today about a lady named Nancy Reagan, who was one of the most powerful first ladies, in, most influential per, uh, first ladies during her time in the White House. She probably ranks in the top five along with people like Edith Wilson, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, Hillary Clinton, of course, and uh, I think Nancy Reagan's probably up in, up in that top five category as well. So um, let's get right to it here. Nancy Reagan was, um, she was born into a family that was from New Jersey that used to have quite a bit of money. And so they were kind of a high class family, but they lost, basically lost their money. So they had kind of this high class uh, history or past, but um, the family wasn't doing very well uh, by the time that she was born. And her biological father basically wasn't a part of her life um, after her birth. He was basically out of the picture. And her first couple years of life when she was a little uh, baby, she actually spent with her mother traveling around because her mother was an actress. And so her mom would go to these different cities where she would, she would be part of these different stage productions. And Nancy Reagan was basically sort of like a, a stage baby who uh, was raised in her first few years um, <clears throat> behind the stage sort of at, at these different productions. So that was kind of an interesting start. Her mom was, was definitely an interesting person. And uh, after not too long, I would say, in Nancy's childhood, her mom actually met uh, <clears throat> somebody who was a pretty famous neurosurgeon at that time. His name was Loyal Davis, which is where Nancy's last name came from, Nancy Davis, because Loyal Davis eventually, was, uh, sorry, he raised her. She was, he was her real father. Uh, in terms of, of sort of like their relationship, right? He was dad in, in terms of their relationship and um, eventually did adopt her. And so suddenly she found herself as a child going from being sort of um, not having much money, single mo being with her mom who was a single mom basically, to all of a sudden her mom has married this uh, famous neurosurgeon and they have this nice house in Chicago. And the really cool thing about this is, is, is also that because of her mom's connections with, with different actresses and different actors, who were also, some of them were quite famous, she got a chance as a child to meet people who were big, big screen stars at, at that time who would actually come and stay at their house in Chicago uh, because of their friendship with, with Nancy's mom. So. She, she as a child or as a teenager met people, for example, Spencer Tracy, who uh, one time gave Nancy advice, and his advice was, know your lines and don't bump into the furniture. Uh, <clears throat> so that was sort of his, his theory of acting. Apparently he didn't really like all of the big um, overacting theory uh, behind all of it, and so he was basically just know your lines, don't bump into the furniture. And of course, Nancy uh, was quite a, quite a nice looking young lady herself and being raised in this kind of atmosphere from her mom's side of things with all these different actors and actresses around, she actually became an actress herself and sort of admits that some of that, of course, had to do with, with her mom's connections. So she became a young actress, actress and again met lots of different Hollywood type people and became friends with a number of them. So um, one of the people she became friends with eventually, or more than friends with, was a guy named Ronald Reagan. And the way that the, that the two met, Nancy and Ronnie, as, as she knew him as Ronnie, uh, that's how she always called him or referred to him, but the way that they met was kind of interesting. Nancy had a very common name, and there were a couple of different Nancy Davises in Hollywood at that time who were probably fairly low-level actresses, such, you know, kind of similar to Nancy herself. And one of them apparently was some kind of, had some kind of connections with communists, which at that time there were all these lists in Hollywood, right? And if you got on a list, such as if you got on this list of communists, then it, was, it could be very hard for you to work. 
So somehow Nancy Davis's name ends up on one of these lists of communists in Hollywood, which she, she certainly wasn't one of those, um, <clears throat> but it was, you know, her name was somehow associated with this, and so she ended up talking or calling, getting in contact with Ronald Reagan, who was the, at that time, he was the president of the Screen Actors Guild. Basically, um, he was the leader of the union for actors and actresses in Hollywood. <clears throat> I hear a boat coming here. We may see a couple of different watercraft during this video. Oh, it stopped. So that's actually how Nancy met Ronnie was that he sort of got involved to try and help her name, help get her name cleared off of this list of, of suspected communists in Hollywood. And as soon as they met and they kind of went out to dinner and he kind of helped her out with that, they found they really liked each other, were very attracted to each other, but it took a, a lot of sort of dating and a long, a long period of time before Reagan was really able to commit to actually marrying Nancy. And uh, part of that, oh. Ronnie was really sort of uh, took a long time to commit to actually marrying Nancy was that he had had kind of a bad experience with a, a prior marriage. His first marriage was to an actress. And um, they had this sort of sudden breakup and divorce, and, and he had a really sort of, he was kind of hurt by this whole thing to the point where he was very hesitant to, to remarry. And, and somehow Nancy convinced him that she was the one, and, and she really was the one, as it turned out. So they did get married in a very small ceremony in 1952, and they were for, forever together, you know, after. Basically, they met in 1949. That's when, when this, this whole thing started between them, and they married in 1952, and uh, they were never apart, basically, after, especially after, after getting married. It was kind of an interesting marriage in that they were they were extremely close throughout their entire marriage to such a, an extent that Nancy herself, as well as others, have kind of st said that there wasn't really there wasn't really room for anyone else. Uh, so once they once they were Ronnie and Nancy, it was kind of like there just wasn't room for for other people to play any kind of role in their in their relationship. Their children, for example, tended to be somewhat distant for, um, <clears throat> from this, right? Because it was kind of like Ronnie and Nancy, and nobody else could kind of get in, in, in here, and that that again continued throughout their their relationship, throughout their their entire lives. Um, so they did have somewhat troubled relationships with a number of their children. Ron had children from. Ronald had children from his first marriage as well as from marriage to Nancy and in both cases there were throughout their lives there were sort of some issues and so a very kind of distant relationship with some of those kids. So in any case Ronald Reagan starts to realize <clears throat> in the early 50s that basically his career has come to an end as a Hollywood actor. He had been you know somewhat of a known actor but at that point he basically wasn't getting any any even reasonably good roles anymore and he starts thinking you know maybe I should turn towards politics maybe that's my future here and a lot of people encouraged him in that Nancy eh, she probably wasn't one of those people but she she kinda went along with it so Reagan eventually he gets himself elected as governor of California which is a very significant position here and this was in the late 60s, so right at the height of all of this stuff that's going on in, in American society, all of this <clears throat> upheaval, right? And Reagan's a very uh, traditional person, as is Nancy. And so they're go he's governor, and she's the, the uh, first lady of California during this very kind of tumultuous period. In 1976, Reagan decides he wants to run for president. And it was kind of an interesting little situation there because he very nearly upset Gerald Ford, who was president at that time. He very nearly got the Republican nomination for president running against a sitting president. In other words, Ford is the Republican president and Ronald Reagan is a Republican challenger. Reagan very, very, very nearly got the nomination instead of the sitting president, Gerald Ford. That is very, very, very rare. And so it was, a, it was a huge achievement. It really put Ronald Reagan and Nancy on the map when they nearly stole that, um, that Republican Party nomination from Gerald Ford. 
Uh, so in the end, he didn't quite get the nomination. Ford loses to Jimmy Carter. Carter becomes president. Well, as soon as the next election comes along, Reagan's kind of sensing weakness, and I know I'm talking about Ronald Reagan here when I, sh you know, this is supposed to be about Nancy, but she's kind of, this is, she's kind of not, not exactly wanting to do all this stuff all the time, but she's kind of coming along with it and supporting Ronnie because she, she really, she really believes that her number one purpose here is sort of kind of to, to support. Uh, and, and also to protect. We'll talk about that later. So in, 80, in 1980, Reagan runs against, against uh, Jimmy Carter and he wins. And so now he's president and, and Nancy Reagan is first lady of the United States and she's moving into the White House all of a sudden here. And so um, it was not very long, however, before she got herself into some, some serious trouble and the media was pretty hard on her. She had, a, she gained a reputation of being very, um, uh, I guess you would say she, she found appearances to be very important. So the Carters, for example, had had a very low-key White House. They hadn't spent much money on anything. They hadn't redecorated anything. And everything was sort of supposed to be very, um, done in a, in a very kind of modest way. And Nancy Reagan, when she becomes First Lady, So when Nancy Reagan moves into the White House and becomes First Lady, there's this sudden shift, right, be between the Carter approach and the, and the Reagan approach, where Nancy finds that she has to really fix up the White House so that it, it is more presidential, and so she spends quite a bit of money there, and um, she's also known for spending a lot of money on clothing, so she's very, in, in terms of appear her personal appearances, she's sort of high-end in terms of the clothing that she's uh, putting out to the world, right, and um, she starts to kind of gain a bad reputation for spending a lot of money and being sort of concerned about these appearances. She didn't want anything. You hear, for example, in her biography, uh, which is, I have to tell you, if you haven't read it, it really is a page turner if, if you're interested in the kind of things that I am. It's called My Turn, and she um, she uses in her biography, probably without realizing it, the term shabby several times, so she talks about how th this or that was shabby, and she didn't want things to look shabby. And um, so that was kind of her first introduction to getting in trouble with the media, became known as sort of the, this dragon lady in, in some ways. Um, but it wasn't very long before something, probably the most important thing in Nancy Reagan's life, uh, happened, which actually it didn't happen to her so much as it happened to her husband, but in her view it happened to her because her husband was the most important thing in her life. And so that was the attempted assassination of Ronald Reagan. And this happened only about three months into Reagan's presidency, so they had not been in the White House for very long at all when Reagan was, you know, giving a little speech at a hotel in, in Washington, D.C., and as he was leaving, of course, um, somebody actually started shooting at him, and one of the bullets bounced off the limo and hit Reagan, and as it turned out, it basically, it nearly killed, it nearly killed Ronald Reagan about three months into his, his presidency. Um, and at first, when, when he was shot, it wasn't really realized. Nancy wasn't actually on at, at the site where this all happened. She was at the White House, not too far away. But if it, it wasn't really realized as soon as Reagan was injured, how badly he was injured. And it, initially, they were going to go back to the safety of the White House, where Nancy was. And th there was sort of this decision made kind of on the fly that, you know what? we should really probably go to the hospital. And that ended up saving Reagan's life. Had they not gone to the hospital, had they not gone directly to the hospital, uh, Reagan would have died. And so Nancy is at the White House and when she hears about all of this, initially it's not really known how serious all of this is, right? They don't really know that Reagan is almost dead. And, um, but when she hears about this, she's of course just absolutely out of her mind and she has to get to the hospital immediately and threatens to walk to the hospital if they don't take her because initially they they wanted her to stay at the White House for you know her own safety and that kind of thing and she basically said if you don't if you don't take me there right now I'm walking so they basically drove her 
to the hospital and of course Reagan was in very very serious condition and that event probably played more of a role in, in her life than anything else. It certainly was more of a, a lasting thing in Nancy's life than even it was in, in Ronald Reagan's life who was the person who was shot and nearly died. So that tells you a lot about Nancy Reagan in that she cared so much for this man that she almost placed him basically at the center of her life as well. And the things that she did were motivated by protecting Ron, protecting Ronnie, her love for Ronnie, and so forth. So Reagan did did survive this um, this shooting, but from that point on, Nancy was very very protective and and sort of kept kept Reagan from from really being in contact, close contact with the American people. He never really, from that point on, three months in, ever really went out and shook hands with anybody or, you know, even during can the next presidential com campaign was also, was held very distant from, from the average American, partly because of Nancy's concerns for his safety and she did not want this to happen again. She was not going to let this happen again. So she kind of walled him off. We have some paddle boarders who will pass through soon. I should tell you about Michael Deaver. He, so talking about this assassination attempt on Ronald Reagan, Michael Deaver was there. He was with Reagan when this happened. And Deaver had been actually with Reagan since his time as governor of California. So Michael Deaver was one of the most important advisors for Reagan. And he really was in charge of, of Reagan's scheduling and how Reagan was presented to the outside world. So. Michael Deaver was really a key a key player in Reagan's transition from being governor to being president and um, he really uh, took a, a major role in, in, in again Reagan's scheduling which is a very important thing and, and all the different places that he would go and meet people and what, what would the president actually be doing right and so Michael Deaver again had been with the Reagans, and I say the Reagans because he was very good friends and very close with both Ron and Nancy. And he'd been with them since Reagan's time as governor, and was again, he was on the 76th campaign where they nearly beat Gerald Ford for the nomination. He was on the 1980 campaign where they beat Carter, and now he is basically, he's, dep he's deputy chief, chief of staff in the White House. and. Um, he decides, Michael Deaver, very, very close to both the President and the First Lady, decides for whatever reason he's going to leave the White House and he's going to kind of go into private business. And up to that time, Nancy had only really trusted Michael Deaver, right, to, to handle Ronnie, to handle his, um, his scheduling and, and how he is presented to the world. And so after Michael Deaver leaves, Nancy Reagan really starts to take charge of um, some of the, the really day-to-day -day things about how Ronald Reagan again how, who is he, where is he going to appear where he, where is he allowed to, to speak all of these different things that a president does that's normally sort of planned out by a chief of staff or a deputy chief of staff Nancy Reagan upon Michael Deaver's departure especially she really starts to take charge on all of those kinds of things and she starts to get into a lot of conflict with some of Reagan's advisors, uh, particularly somebody named Donald Reagan, not to be confused with Ronald Reagan. I remember when I was a little kid, I always wondered, like, who is this Donald Reagan? How is he, what does he have to do with Ronald Reagan? Because they sound so similar. But Donald Reagan was the new chief of staff who would normally do these kind of things, right? He would normally control access to the president and and when does the president appear in front of the media who where does the president speak and that kind of thing well she starts trying to control those kind of things and she starts butting heads especially with donald reagan the the new chief of staff so oftentimes reagan would like the president to go out more and sort of be more uh, with the, the American people. He would like him to speak more to the media. He would like him to do more things that got him out there, right? That was Don Regan's view of what Ronald Reagan should be doing to really be an effective and popular president. And he's now coming into conflict with Nancy Reagan, who's trying to really protect Ronnie, seal him off from any kind of possible problems, any kind of possible harm. And as 
as Nancy Reagan put it in her in her uh, biography, she didn't resent all the security, right? A lot of presidents and first ladies, they really they grow to resent all of the secret service security around them and they just want to be normal people and go normal places. Nancy actually wanted all of that security there because that was what helped her seal uh, seal Ronnie off from from the rest of America right from the rest of the people who could possibly harm him possibly embarrass him possibly take advantage of him and so forth so she's really butting heads with Don Regan who eventually is kind of forced out partly because of her although he wasn't very popular with other people around the Reagan White House or people in Washington in general so he is kind of forced out partly on Nancy's um, as a, as a result of Nancy's efforts and kind of whispering in her husband's ear and that kind of thing but uh, so then Don Regan the former chief of staff goes and writes a book it's called From Wall Street to Washington and in this book he he made this major rev revelation this was late in the Reagan presidency but he basically revealed that Nancy Reagan was using astrologers especially one in uh, San Francisco that she really trusted and she would consult with this astrologer and get what was called good days and bad days from the from the astrologer and so good days were days when Ronnie would be allowed to maybe travel or to give us a major speech and bad days were days that we would she would try to really keep Ronnie kind of secluded in the White House and not really let him out you know there could be something bad could happen on on the bad days and so it, multiple chiefs of staff whether it be uh, Don Regan or, or others that that served Reagan had to kind of deal with this they had to deal with the fact that Ronald Reagan's schedule was sort of being determined in to some extent by the predictions of this astrologer that Nancy Reagan was regularly consulting and that if they wanted to try and have the president do something on a bad day Nancy would basically um, put an end to that and say no we're not doing that and typically she got her way because of Ronald Reagan kind of put up with with Nancy's kind of um, interference in some of these things and because Ronald Reagan didn't stop it or didn't speak out against it he, he basically implicitly allowed her to have the final say on a lot of those kinds of things so that's part of where I say she was one of the more powerful first ladies was that in the end if Nancy really felt strongly about something that was what was going to happen especially when it came to kind of managing the president and she did more and more throughout throughout Reagan's eight years manage the president again after especially after Michael Deaver departed the White House one of the interesting things about Ronald Reagan that you have to understand in order to understand Nancy's uh, role here is that Ronald Reagan unlike probably many presidents he did not give orders and he did not really make decisions now this isn't to say that he was dumb this isn't to say that he had no idea what was going on but Ronald Reagan was he was a big picture guy so he would he would come up with the the whole big ideas of what what his presidency was all about right and basically he would express those ideas in speeches he would express those ideas on the campaign trail and then he basically expected the people who worked for him his cabinet members or the people around him in the White House he expected those people to basically on their own do those things without any really explicit instruction right so he wasn't the kind of president who said I we're having a meeting and here's my decision or here's what I want you to do uh, you know Secretary of Defense here's what I want you to do go out and do it that wasn't Ronald Reagan he let those people do their thing based on sort of his overall general uh, pronouncements in, in speeches and again in campaigns and that kind of thing so uh, along with that goes Reagan's um, he was this sort of kind of good-natured happy guy and and uh, very positive person very upbeat and so he also had this inability to deal in details and so he, again big picture right but as soon as details came along he just there just wasn't any interest he didn't understand that whole aspect of things and so he was he was very Ronald Reagan was very vulnerable to the fact that people could kind of do things 
and he didn't necessarily really know all of the details of what was going on. He just knew that they were probably acting in his best interest since he was a very positive guy, right? Oh, I'm sure they're acting in my best interest. Well, Nancy was his sort of um, reality check. She, she was the kind of person who was very, she was very worried about everything. She, um, she knew the details were very important. She knew that people could try to take advantage of someone like Ronald Reagan who probably liked to view everything in a positive way and didn't like to dig into all of the details of exactly what's going on around him. And so she took the role, especially with staffing matters, as um, she was the person who kind of made decisions on who had to go, right? If, some, if somebody had to go, she would sort of make that decision, like, this person has to go. Don Regan is an example of, of one of those situations. Because Ronald Reagan really didn't make a lot of decisions, he didn't, um, he didn't give a lot of orders, somebody had to do that. And it, it kind of came to Nancy to do a lot of that, again, especially when it came to, to staffing issues of people around Ronald Reagan. And uh, so, again, she was oftentimes butting heads not only with those people around Reagan, but also with the media who kind of, you know, portrayed her many times as kind of this, um, this ins insidious kind of influence behind Reagan's presidency, um, which there may be, you know, something to that. But again, if you ask Nancy Reagan, that was absolutely necessary, right? Because of Ronald Reagan's personality, he had to be protected. He had to have somebody who, who could make those tough decisions, give those orders, and give people the news that they didn't want to hear sometimes, right? That had to be done. So oftentimes Nancy did that. And Ronnie, for his part, kind of let her do that. Not only did Nancy protect Ronald Reagan when he was president, physically, but also protect him in, in other ways as well, from people who she felt were sort of bad influences on him or might try to take advantage of him. But also when, when Reagan's eight years as president came to an end, uh, Nancy also went on to continue to sort of be his protector and defender in, in his years once he left the president, presidency because um, it became clear not too long after Reagan left the White House that you know he was having problems with memory and um, sort of t starting to experience some of the first signs of what later was diagnosed as Alzheimer's disease. And Nancy kind of noticed this fairly early on after after they had left the White House that you know Ronnie he can still give his speeches you know when he does a speech, but. He just doesn't seem quite right. He sometimes seems like, you know, there's just something missing that was there before. He, he is diagnosed as, with Alzheimer's and writes this kind of very uh, important and interesting um, release, press, press release to kind of the American people where he tells people basically, look, I have Alzheimer's disease and it's gonna be downhill from here. And it, it was. And, um, so Nancy, as, as Reagan becomes more and more out of touch, right, they're living in Bel Air, California, where they've kind of got this, this nice house with, with um, kind of gates around it and everything, and Nancy's already kind of trying to seal him off again from the outside world because she doesn't want, she wants to protect Reagan's legacy, she doesn't want him to be embarrassed, she doesn't want uh, the world to see what is becoming of Ronald Reagan in his in his um, in his days with Alzheimer's, and so to give you an example, um, John Kennedy Jr. wanted to do as part of this magazine he owned, he wanted to come out and take pictures of Ronald Reagan during this time when he was suffering from Alzheimer's disease, and Nancy Reagan said no. I don't want you coming out here and doing that. That's not the way I want my husband portrayed. It's not the way I want my husband to be remembered. He's in really rough shape, and we don't want the world to, to see that. Not wanting leaks to come out. She understood, of course, that if you allow anybody in, somebody's gonna leak something about how Ronnie's in terrible shape, and, and, and she, she didn't want, she understood that leaks will happen if anybody gets close. Close. And so the only people she really allowed in 
after uh, Reagan left the White House and was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease was the close family of, of Ronald Reagan were really the only people who got to, you know, come and, come and interact with, with this person who was now basically lost. It was very tough for Nancy to kind of witness this because she, she loved Ronnie so much and they were sort of kind of meant for each other in a way. Uh, it was very hard on her. She, she was very sort of, um, I guess, was having a very tough, tough time of it herself. She would very rarely ever leave the house very ever, very rarely ever leave Ronnie for more than maybe just an hour to go have lunch with, with a friend or something like that, but she would always rush right back to the house and basically spent all of her time at the house with Ronnie, basically taking care of him, again protecting him, and um, she wanted to not be gone for very long partly I think because she wanted to be there when he died. So because of Ronnie's condition with Alzheimer's, Nancy was very affected by this and when when Ronald Reagan died, uh, I think the one thing that sort of gave her comfort in all of this that made her feel a little bit better was that there was this sort of significant outpouring of of concern and, and of, of affection towards Ronald Reagan upon his death and that was something that um, I think was in some ways a bit unexpected. Maybe it was thought that it had been a long time since he was president, or maybe it was thought that he wasn't really relative, relevant to, to that time period that he died and that kind of thing. But there really was quite a significant recognition upon his death of how important he had been. And, and I think that really helped Nancy feel, um, feel better about things. And kind of maybe pulled her out of some depressing times to some extent, but during both the time when Reagan ha had Alzheimer's as well as after his death, Nancy Reagan was very, uh, she was a very big advocate of stem cell research. And this is kind of interesting for a couple of reasons. Number one is that typically people with Nancy's political beliefs would not be in favor of stem cell research. and because Ronald Reagan had Alzheimer's and because stem cell research might you know contribute to some kind of Alzheimer's cure or treatment uh, she you know was was in favor of stem cell research because it affected somebody very close to her and I always find that kind of interesting how people's political beliefs can change based on their own personal experience or somebody close to them having an experience, just to give you another example, Jim Brady, who was Reagan's press secretary, was shot during the assassination temp attempt of Ronald Reagan, <clears throat> and Jim Brady, a conservative, went on, after, after he was shot, he went on to be a big advocate of uh, gun, gu gun laws and, and restrictions on, on guns and purchasing of gun and guns and that kind of thing. So it's, it is kind of interesting how Nancy Reagan and Jim Brady both once their their own lives were affected by something, they've suddenly changed their views on, on that particular topic. So Nancy's views were very much in favor of stem cell research. She advocated for it. And um, so that was one of her lasting, one of her last and lasting uh, contributions in, in life. So when, Re when Nancy Reagan did die, she was um, buried next to her husband, Ronnie, who was such a huge part of her life and who was basically kind of like completed her and um, she was buried next to Ronnie there at um, his presidential library up on the hill in Simi Valley California and um, that is the that is the story of Nancy Reagan it is really quite an interesting story I think everything from her her time in Hollywood and all of the different people that she met in Hollywood to her time as the dragon lady, first lady, and um, how she was uh, sometimes very influential in um, especially making decisions surrounding the president and the White House in terms of staffing, and as well her, her influence in terms of keeping Ronald Reagan really very walled off from things, not only in his retirement when he had Alzheimer's disease, but also during the, his time in, Weist, in the White House when he was president, the fact that that Reagan never really got out, got to go out and really shake hands with the average American, in some ways that um, that really changed things. I think in, in 
in terms of um, how things were seen by people, right? Reagan was seen as this person who was kind of difficult to understand and, and distant. And I think part of that was, was Nancy's walling him off and part of it was just his personality. Um, but she was, again, a very influential first lady, probably within the top five most. And that is the story on the White River of Nancy Reagan. So, until our next Stories from Somewhere, goodbye.